from the colleges and universities of the nation, CBS television brings you the search. The search to know and understand man and his work. The search for a richer, happier life for all. Chamber operator, take us to 8,000 feet, please. Roger. Chamber going to 8,000 feet, 3,000 feet per minute. I'm Charles Romine. We're at the School of Aviation Medicine of the United States Air Force at Randolph Field, Texas. We're going on a journey to the new frontiers of our planet, to the boundaries of human travel into space. This is Colonel Mike Sweeney, Director of Research of the U.S. Air Force School of Aviation Medicine. Colonel Sweeney, uh, actually, uh, just what is aviation medicine? How does it differ from other kinds of medicine? In aviation medicine, we are not only fighting the ordinary or general diseases of mankind, but something else in addition. We are, in a sense, combating man's own accomplishments in that we are combating the resultant strains from man's ability to fly fast and high. That is to say, speed and altitude. Today, uh, aviation design and engineering development have produced planes capable of carrying man to altitudes that the human body cannot tolerate. Finding man's limits, tolerance to these strains and determining ways of protecting him in this unnatural environment, that's a major factor in aviation medicine. Well, how do you go about tackling this problem? Well, one of the first things we had to do was develop some pretty accurate simulators. Simulators? Yes. It isn't feasible to do all of your experimentation in flight. Therefore, we recreate as many of the characteristics as possible in the laboratory and study them there. This piece of equipment we've been looking at is a decompression chamber, low pressure chamber. Now here in this decompression chamber, we can create uh, altitude conditions from ground level to 100,000 feet. In the test you're going to see, we will be subjecting this man to a sudden decompression. That is a simulation of a structural failure in a pressure cabin. We're going to see the effects of going from 40,000 feet to about 65,000 feet in a fraction of a second. Chamber level at 40,000 feet. Instruments cleared. Signal when ready. OK, pop it. Chamber level at 63,000 feet. Free fall at 30,000 feet, please. Roger, chamber free falling at 30,000 feet. Chamber level at 30,000 feet. How do you feel? OK, this time. Take me down to ground level, please. Roger. Chamber going to ground level at 3,000 feet per minute. How are your ears? Can you equalize the pressure? Ears are OK. Let me know when we get 10,000, please. Roger. We do this test to uh, acquaint the flyer with what might happen to him in flight. When an emergency takes place, uh, after he's been through this test, uh, he'll know what to do automatically. Chamber at 10,000 feet. You can take off your mask now. Chamber ground level. How did you find the mobility of your head and neck when the cap captain pressure came on and after the decompression, King? Well, Colonel, uh, the mobility is very free in your head and neck, isn't it? Very little restriction. 
That's kind of a curious outfit you've got on. Tell me, what's the purpose of this suit? Well, the purpose of this suit is to allow your extreme pressures, your breathing within your mask. So when you're at high altitudes, this is what takes care of you. It puts the same kind of pressure all over you. Huh? Yes. I see. Thanks very much. Without the pressure suit and helmet, we just couldn't save the man's life. Well, I've seen what altitude can do to the human body. What about speed? Colonel Chick Henderson at Wright Air Development Center, where they're working on all aspects of speed and acceleration, can answer that problem. Colonel Henderson, what happens to the pilot when he's subjected to great speeds? Turns at high and supersonic speeds produce what we call G-force or acceleration. A one G-force is equal to the pull of the Earth's gravity. Two and three Gs and so on are equal to two and three times that force. Only the faster and longer the motion goes on, the more intense are its effects. This machine helps us find the answers to some of those problems. What is it? A centrifuge. It can simulate G-forces up to 21 Gs. That is, 21 times the pull of the Earth's gravity, which is far more than anyone can take. We found that five seconds of six Gs is enough to make a person black out. He's up to six Gs now. He's been there certainly more than five seconds. There's an explanation for it. Notice the suit he's wearing. That's what does it. It permits a flyer to take greater G-force than would otherwise be possible. Oh, this is what you call a G-suit, is that right? Well, uh, how does it work? Well, this suit contains five pneumatic bladders, one in the stomach, two in the thighs, two in the calves, which automatically inflate when, as the G comes on. This increases the blood pressure, which the heart supplies to the brain, therefore counteracting some of the G in these conditions. We developed and tested the G-suit on the centrifuge, and it is now used in all of our jet fighter aircraft. Well, it seems to me that aviation medicine has done a pretty good job of solving the problems of added speeds and altitude. Yes, I'll agree with you, so long as the man is inside the plane. But what if something goes wrong and the flyer has to get out? This is the way it was done in the old days of low speeds and low altitudes. That is, anything below 300 miles per hour and 25,000 feet. But to get out of a jet plane traveling at 600 miles or more and at an altitude of maybe 50,000 feet is completely impossible under the old-fashioned style where you jump out under your own power. There's only one way to do it. Pull your throttle back. Activate your oxygen bottle. Up on your left armrest. This is a test of catapult ejection. The only way to get a man out of an aircraft flying at supersonic speeds is to fire him out, seat and all. We developed this gadget called an upward ejection track. With it, we can accustom the flyer to the actual feeling in an emergency in the air. Head back, chin in, feet in place, arms in place. Fire when ready. This method of ejection seat bailout has already saved the lives of about 400 of our Air Force pilots. This is fine for the single-seat fighters, but in our larger jet bombers, we need something new, a system of downward ejection. Have you been able to use downward ejection yet? Yes, it has already been successfully tested in the air and has saved the life of a bombardier of a B-47. I myself have ejected at over 500 miles per hour at 10,000 feet. But we have tested it above 45,000 feet, the highest altitude 
at which man has ever bailed out at over 500 miles an hour. And we expect to continue our tests to find out how much higher and faster we can go with it. For instance, if you had just been catapulted out of a supersonic plane at high altitude, this is what the Earth would look like. You must fall a long way before you can safely open your chute. Your body spins violently as you fall. How much can a man take and still come out of it alive? This is one of the things we're still in the process of finding out. This is what we built to test the tumbling factor. It is called a spin table. Well, what does this test do? It simulates the tumbling a man would go through after he bailed out by catapult ejection. What we have found is that a man can tolerate tumbling at 160 revolutions per minute or from three to seven seconds before he becomes unconscious. But his automatic parachute will take care of him. As you can see, we still have a long way to go. Uh, for example, uh, the effect of wind blast on the man when he's ejected at high speed. What do you mean, uh, wind blast? Well, Lieutenant Colonel John Stapp is conducting an experiment on this very thing on the track at Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico. We're here at the Aero Medical Field Laboratory of the Holloman Development Center in Alamogordo, New Mexico, to witness a spectacular event. We're going to see the rocket-propelled sled test run with Colonel John P. Stapp, chief of the Aero Medical Field Laboratory, as the subject. In a few minutes, this sled will shoot down the track with its human passenger faster than any ground vehicle has ever gone. Colonel Stapp is secured in the rocket sled by a special nylon web harness over his shoulders and chest. He wears no protective clothing except a plastic helmet and clear plastic visor. The purpose of the test is to determine the effects of wind blast and slowdown on aircrew men bailing out of planes at supersonic speed. The sled will be propelled by nine rockets, exerting a total force of a 40,000-pound thrust to hurl the sled down 2,800 feet of track. Slow-motion cameras are mounted on the sled. Recording instruments are set up on Colonel Stapp to accurately determine the effects of acceleration, deceleration, and wind blast. Last-minute details are carefully checked. Everything is in readiness at X minus 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 25 seconds. 25 seconds. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. 15. 15. 14. 14. 13. 12. 11. 10. 9. 8. 7. 6. 5. 4. 3. 2. 1. Fire. Missile away. In five seconds, an acceleration to 632 miles per hour, the fastest ground speed ever to be attained by man. In little more than six seconds, the test is over and a new ground speed record is attained. Colonel Stapp is helped out of the sled, apparently suffering no ill effects. Colonel Stapp? Yes. Colonel, that was an amazing feat. Could you tell us uh, what were the actual accomplishments of this test? First of all, getting up to 632 miles an hour on the ground exposed me to the same wind pressure conditions that a pilot would encounter on emerging from a cockpit in an ejection seat at an altitude of 35,000 feet and a speed of 1,000 miles an hour. Second, the pattern of deceleration, that is, the slowdown from 632 miles an hour to a stop in one and four-tenths seconds, that's... Uh, two tons, I believe, on the body. You mean during that one and one-tenth second period, your body weighed more than two tons? Yes, I weighed two tons, and I could tell it, too. What were the effects on you? 
First of all, the sled took off, and it was like being hit in the back by a freight train. That lasted for five seconds. The last two seconds of that time, I had a quick visual blackout. Then the sled went into the coasting phase, and there, my sight was immediately restored. I got a quick glimpse of entering the water breaks, after which my eyeballs hit my eyelids with such force that I was seeing red and shimmering little lights until the sled came to a stop. They took the equipment off of me. I wasn't feeling very good. And I felt even worse when I held my eyes open with my fingers and I couldn't see anything. That lasted for eight and a half minutes. Did you have any lasting effects? None whatsoever. Well, let's put it this way. The morning after the run, I had a couple of very black eyes. In fact, I uh, might say they were supersonic shiners. How are the findings from this test valuable in aviation medicine? Primarily in determining human limits of tolerance in comparison with aircraft performance, especially in the field of seat ejection for escape from high-performance aircraft. How does it feel to be the fastest man on Earth? Uh, I'd rather be known as the man who's had the fastest stop. After all, that's what does the Air Force some good. Perhaps now you can see that one of our major problems is to protect our personnel who fly. And I believe we've been able to show you some of the ways that we've learned to protect these people. Now I'd like to show you a department of our school, which is a logical outgrowth of what you've been seeing. As aircraft go further into space, space flight will become not a possibility, or a probability, but a fact. For this story, you ought to talk to Dr. Hubertus Strugold. Dr. Strugold, what are the prospects for space travel? Let me say just this. For the present stage of development, I prefer the term space flight. But we must reckon with the possibility that within the next 50 years, men will not only make routine flight under space conditions in the vicinity of the Earth, but also that he will travel to or around the moon. 50 years? Now, how, how will that be possible? In the last few years, rockets have become almost a commonplace. We have already sent them 250 miles in the air. And there is hardly any doubt that the engineers will enable us to propel the rocket into outer space. Putting men in them is our next problem. And this is just what we are working on in space medicine. This experimental chamber is a prototype of the sealed cabin men would have to live in in a rocket ship. We must provide and maintain an adequate artificial atmosphere in such a cabin. One of the problems men have to face during space flight. There are others. Collisions with meteorites, cosmic rays, the tremendous acceleration pressure, and of course, all the psychological hazards in living in a circumscribed area, and in an environment where there is no, neither up nor down. Neither up nor down, now, what do you mean by that? One of the strange things in space flight is the fact that no force of gravity will be felt. Men will be completely weightless. This is a condition which near the ground can be produced only for a few seconds. For example, in the first moment of a fast descending elevator or in a free fall. Well now, could anybody stand that or could they get used to that sort of thing? We hope so. We hope that we become used to it. The fact is that tests have already been made to study the effect of weightlessness on animals. In one of the rocket launchings, 
by the Air Research and Development Command, four passengers, two monkeys and two mice were sent 37 miles up into the sky. The medical doctors were going to test on them the effects of three conditions which any living creature would experience in spaceflight. First, the tremendous pressure of acceleration during takeoff. Second, the weightlessness during most of the remainder of the flight. And at last, how to get them safely back to the Earth. What would happen to the animals as they underwent these rapid changes from one unnatural condition to another? Cameras inside the rocket recorded on film just what was happening to the mice throughout their trip. In the control room, recording instruments kept the scientists informed of how the heart, blood pressure, etc. of the monkeys were affected. Everything was ready in the tense moments before the rocket Fire. was fired. Acceleration after takeoff subjects the mice to 4G or four times the normal pull of gravity. This means that they weigh four times their normal weight and their legs are unable to support them. By the time all fuel is burnt, the rocket is hurtling up at more than 1900 miles per hour. Without support from the rocket motor, the missile actually floats on up and the mice and the ball float too in their container. Now they are weightless and the confusion of the mice becomes more pronounced. To them, there is no up or down. At 190,000 feet, that 36 miles, the nose cone is separated by a small powder charge. A ribbon drag parachute has come out simultaneously, but has no effect yet. The nose is in a free fall. The mice are still weightless. As the capsule falls to lower altitude, it begins to slow up. The ribbon parachute bites into denser air and the nose decelerates rapidly. For the mice, zero gravity gives way to a deceleration force of 4 to 5 g. At 20,000 feet, a second parachute has blossomed out, uh, gently lowering the nose to earth. This is the last leg of the journey and gradually the weight goes back to normal. The mice and the monkeys who made this trip experienced and survived without any ill effects some of the major difficulties of spaceflight. Pressure, many times their own weight, weightlessness, life in an artificial atmosphere and escape. This brief test revealed no reason why men cannot fly just as high into the sky as monkeys and mice. The primary concern in aviation medicine is the human being, keeping man equal to or better ahead of the engineering and technical advances in aeronautical science. The objective is the extension of man's horizons to the furthest reaches of the universe. Through testing and experimentation, the search goes on. Many great advancements have been made. Many things are still left to be done. It is only a matter of time, however, until we should conquer space.